Friend Flicker by Mary O'Hara, Chapter 34. The mountain barriers of Sherman Hill were overridden at last, and it was not one storm only, but half a dozen of them that rolled up from different points on the horizon and collided. Masses of purplish black clouds exploded in deafening crashes, or thundering in long, rolling barrages. Glowing balls of electricity ran along the steel tracks of the railroad and the barbed wire fences. Swords of lightning slashed to the ground, one right after the other. It was as if creatures of terrible size and impossible grandeur were struggling in the upper airs, and the earth was spattered with the spent shot and flame. McLaughlin was on the Lincoln Highway, nearing the ranch when the full force of the storm struck him. At the same moment he was finding it difficult to steer the car, and a sudden bumping and grinding made him realise he had a flat tyre. Not in the best weather and under the calmest conditions could Rob McLaughlin change a tyre without feeling profane. In such weather as this, and without a slicker, drenched through, half drowned, Barely able to keep his footing against the torrents of rain, he bent over the rear wheel, his curses following the ear-splitting cracks of thunder. He boiled with anger. Anger at the car, anger at the storm, anger at Ken, who must catch his death of cold sitting in the water with Flicker on his lap, just when it was time to go back to school. Anger, above all, against Flicker. Flicker, Flicker, Flicker. That was all he had heard all summer. If it hadn't been for Flicker, Ken wouldn't be sick, and he himself wouldn't be here this minute, with streams of water running into his boots and down the back of his neck. It crossed his mind that by now Gus must have carried out his orders and put an end to the filly. But he wondered, had he? The conviction came to him that Flicker was still alive. When he reached home and stepped out of the car, Gus was waiting for him, to tell him of having taken the tarps and covered the haystacks. Rob hurried into the house, Gus behind him, shouting to make himself heard above the howling of the wind and the crashing of the thunder. They entered the kitchen and stood there, Rob peeling off his wet coat and shaking the water from his hair and eyes. Nell met them. How's Ken? said Rob before he answered Gus, and hunted in the pockets of the coat he was holding for the package of medicine. He seems a little better, said Nell. Anyway, he's been talking. He's not out of his head. Gus, said McLaughlin, turning to the Swede, did you shoot the filly? Boss, answered Gus, I didn't. I gave the order. You've had plenty of time. I, I couldn't do it. Rob picked up his wet coat and began pulling it on again. Where's the Winchester? he said. Up in the bunkhouse. Go get it. Gus went slowly out of the door. Nell clutched Rob's arm. Oh, Rob, don't do it. Kenny knows she's alive. He thinks she's get well. Give him something to hope for. I gave the order, he said. I see no reason for countermanding it. On the contrary, it would have been a lot better if she had been shot weeks ago. It meant nothing but trouble and misery for all of us. Look what it's brought Ken to. I wish you wouldn't. He needn't know. He'll hear the shot. In this storm, he'll think it's thunder. No, no, he won't. He'll know it's the Winchester. How? He'll know. Gus entered the room, holding the Winchester in one hand and one long shell in the other. There's only one shell, boss. Where are the others? There was a whole box of them. The officers shot them all off that Sunday, Davis here. Rob snatched the shell. One's enough. Gus said, You'll find a filly in a sling on the far side of the creek. Tim and I rigged it up for her when we saw she still had it life in her. Rob got his flashlight off the shelf and went out. Gus raised sorrowful eyes to Nell's white face. Don't take it so hard, missus, he said softly. The boss is right. No good to let sick animals live. Nell looked away, 
pressed one hand to her cheek and swallowed her tears. Then she turned back to Gus with more composure. You go on up to bed, Gus, she said. It's late. Everything will be all right. Don't worry about me. Good night, Mrs., he said humbly, and went out of the kitchen door, pressing his hat on his grey curls. Nell ran upstairs to Ken. If he was asleep, if only he was asleep, but he was wide awake. He had pulled himself up on his pillows, and his eyes were alert. That was Dad's car, wasn't it, Mother? Yes, darling, his home. Nell fell on her knees beside the bed, took the child in her arms, and held his head against her breast in such a way that her hand was over his ear. Rob thrust the shell into the rifle. Holding the gun under his left arm, he used the flashlight with his right. He knew the way as well as he knew the way around his own room, but the light picked out his footing for him. His anger had passed, but the thing had to be done, and he went through the gate between the green and the calf pasture, and on past the cow barn. Going down the path along the fence, he bent his head so the driving rain wouldn't slash his eyes. Where was it, Gus said, he had rigged the sling? He came to a stop, trying to see through the darkness, listening, waiting for a flash of lightning. A blinding flash came, and another and another, illuminating the whole pasture, while the skies exploded with thunder. Before the darkness shut the scenes out, Rob had seen three things. He saw the filly in the sling on the far side of the creek, the rock slide behind her. He saw, down at the end of the field, the cattle bunched together, on guard, frightened, staring. And he saw what they were staring at, something white lying on the ground near the three pines with a huge mountain lion crouched over it. Rob stood motionless in the darkness, thinking. He wondered if the mountain lion had seen him. The next flash of lightning answered him, for the lion had disappeared. What was that white thing lying on the ground? Rob wanted to investigate. But he dared not move. Just one shell in the gun. He stood still for a long time, all his senses trained, listening, trying to see through the darkness, the gun ready in his hands, cocked, half lifted. The lightning flashes showed the cattle still bunched, watching, and the white thing on the ground with no moving creature near it. Then McLaughlin saw two blazing green eyes fastened upon him. He could not tell whether they were near or far until a flash of lightning showed him that they were in the center of a mass of shrubs. The lion had hidden himself in those shrubs and was looking out at him from there. The eyes seemed quite steady. Rob raised his gun, took aim, and fired. It seemed to him that just before he pressed the trigger, the eyes had disappeared. He lowered the gun and stood warily, listening and looking. After a while, he strode boldly over to the bushes, shouting and brandishing his gun. With the aid of his flashlight, he looked all through them and found, as he had expected, that he had missed. There was no sign of the lion. Then he re examined the carcass near the three pines and saw that it was the remains of one of the yearling heifers. There was little left of it now. It was not a fresh kill. Rob remembered that when he drove into the ranch with Rodney Scott that afternoon, he had noticed hawks wheeling above the three pines. He wondered if the cat would kill again that night. Was it hungry? Or had it eaten? Even that would not mean much, for it would kill on any vagrant impulse, for food, for fear, for fun, or for fury. And here in the pasture were cows and heifers and horse meat. Flicker, so tired up that she could not move, even if she had the strength. Rob's ready anger flared up. That was the sort of thing men did to animals, took away their natural means of protection, and then failed to protect them by other means. Well, He'd have to stand guard over Flicker all night. 
First the cattle must be driven into the cow barn. He did this in a fury of anxiety over the filly. He hurried to her as soon as he had shut up the cows. Flicker welcomed him with a little grunting whinny. He patted her head. You win, Flicker. The blanket had stretched with the rain and had let her down a few inches. Rob saw that she was bearing her weight on her own feet and he began to think for the first time that there was a chance for her recovery. The storm was passing away, scattered by a wind high up which tore the clouds to pieces. Rob suddenly saw a bright star looking out from between two clouds and then disappear. Well, we're in for it, Flicker, he said, stroking the filly's nose. A night of it. You're a drowned rat and I'm another. I'd feel better if I had a pocket full of shells and a drink and a fire and some dry clothes. In the inner pocket of his shirt he had matches and a pouch of dry tobacco. He lit the pipe. He thought of trying to make a fire, but every stick of wood around was soaking wet. As he smoked, his thoughts traced out a line of probable events. Nell had heard the shot. She knew he had but one shell. She would wonder why he didn't return. She'd remember the wildcat. She'd be worried, and she wouldn't worry long without doing something. He had barely reached this conclusion when he saw a light approaching, swinging and bobbing down the path. Hey, Nell! Rob, are you all right? Where are you? Here, on the far side of the brook. He swung the flashlight. Presently, he saw her anxious face, lit from underneath by the light of the lantern in her hand. Under her other arm, she carried the big express rifle. She was in an old khaki pants and a sweater. Good girl. He went to help her across the brook where there were some stones and took the heavy gun and lantern from her. What happened? I heard a shot. Was that Flicker? No, the mountain lion. Ah, did you get him? No. When you didn't come back, that's what I thought of. So you brought a gun. Just what I was wanting. I feel a whole lot better now. Look at Flicker, said Nell. She can't make out what's happening. See how she watches us. Nell went to the filly and stroked her face. See, she knows me. Nell turned to look up at Rob. She certainly seems brighter. Do you think she has a chance? Can't say. I wouldn't think so. But this bronc blood is tough. Nell smoothed the filly's face and murmured to her. Rob, I do so want her to get well. Why do you say it that way? Well, Ken, they're so bound up in each other. If she gets well, he'll get well. Rob's voice rose with a trace of anger. Don't say that. He'll get well anyway. Why, Nell, you don't really think he's in danger, do you? He's had lots of colds and fever. They both have. Nell was quiet a moment, then shook her head. Not like this, Rob. And Rodney's coming again tomorrow. Rodney doesn't make daily calls for nothing. Besides, it's the way Ken looks. Rob said gruffly, He'll be all right, you'll see. He'll be a different boy in the morning. He heard the shot. How did he take it? Well, he took it. Didn't question it. Didn't seem to rebel. I was holding him, trying to shut the sound out of his ears. But just then the thunder wasn't crashing, and he moved a little. And then came the shot. And a gunshot doesn't sound just like anything else. No, what did he do? His face changed. He pulled out of my arms, sat up, and fell back. Put his face in the pillow and didn't speak again. I gave him the sleeping powder the doctor left for him. It's a strong one. He went to sleep. He's sleeping now. That's why I could leave him. There was silence for a moment. And then Rob said, Nell... If Ken should waken and ask, I think it would be better not to tell him that the filly is alive. She's been dead and alive and dead and alive so many times it keeps him on the rack. She may be dead by morning. It wouldn't surprise me. And the boy has accepted her death and he's asleep. With Flicker dead, he'll sleep for a month. 
If she's alive, he'll be all strung up again. Nell agreed. I won't tell him. Then Rob told her about the slain heifer. I knew there was something over there, she said. The dogs were barking in this pasture today, and there were a lot of magpies in the trees. She looked around uneasy. Do you think he's around? I don't think. I know. Can he see us right now? He's got eyes. But is he watching us and Flicker this minute? Rob laughed. Sure, he knows his business, and right now that's us. Nell's frightened eyes swept the wall of darkness around them, and she shuddered. Rob examined the rifle to see if there was a shell in it. I loaded it, said Nell briefly, and here. She put her hand to the hip pocket of her pants and handed Rob his revolver. Rob laughed again as he took it. You weren't taking any chances, were you? Why, you're an arsenal. As Nell emptied rifle and revolver shells out of her other pockets. I wish he'd show himself this minute, said Nell, and get himself shot. What do you think he'll do? We may never see him again. He's been shot at once. He sees me here. He may take for the woods. Well, if he doesn't, here is Flicker. Yes, well, I'm spending the night with Flicker. I can't get her up to the stables. She can't walk. That's what I thought you'd do, said Nell. She seized Rob's hand. Rob, you'll like ice. Well, I'm wet to the skin, and that wind was keen. It stopped raining now. We could make a fire here and get you dried out. That's what I was thinking. Here, where are you going? Back to get some dry kindling and wood. No, no, I won't let you carry all that stuff down. You stay here, and I'll get it. No, you go, and I'll stay. They argued as to who should have the lantern, the flashlight, the gun, the revolver. There was danger going, danger staying. Nell went off with the revolver and the flashlight. Rob called. And bring some oats for Flicker. We'll see if she can eat. Nell returned, laden like a pack animal. She had a sack of kindling and wood on her back, bath towel and dry clothes for Rob over one arm, poncho, pillow and blankets over the other, and a flask of whiskey and the revolver in hip pockets. It would be fine, she thought, as she staggered down the path if I met the lion now, and she was choking with laughter as Rob helped her over the stepping stones of the creek. Why, said Rob reproachfully, as she unloaded, you forgot Flicker's oats. Nell laid her hand upon her bosom, which appeared enormous. Is this my natural figure? Rob stepped forward gravely. What is that, anyway? She pulled up her sweater and produced a muslin salt sack filled with oats. He grinned as he took it and carried it to Flicker. The filly lipped the oats out of his hand and her ears came forward eagerly. Well, I'll be, said Rob. See, said Nell, smoothing her nose. She's going to eat again and get well, and Ken will get well. Forget that, said Rob. He began to make a fire, choosing a spot about ten feet away from Flicker. Watch her now. She's never seen a fire. Talk to her. But she smelled smoke from the house fires, said Nell, petting the filly. Haven't you, baby? And the house was where Ken came from, so you like smoke? Anyway, she's got plenty sense, this little girl. Flicker's ears were pricked forward, her eyes very wide, and her whole face showed such intense curiosity and astonishment that Nell burst out laughing. The flames rose and crackled and Flicker stared, then looked around questioning, asking of the darkness. And of Nell, what is this? The important thing to decide, said Nell, is whether to take a drink now or wait until I'm in dry clothes. Take it now, said Nell promptly. Rob took a good swig from the bottle and handed it to her. Want one? Nell shook her head thinking of the night vigil at Ken's bedside, which was before her. Rob asked her to hold the rifle while she changed his clothes. He stood naked by the fire, rubbing himself down with the towel. The warm liquor heated his stomach, and a mood of hilarious well-being took possession of him. If it weren't for Ken and that slinking beast close by... I'll rub your back, said Nell. Taking the towel from him, she scoured his backbone. Then, as he dressed in dry clothes, she squatted by the fire and stared at the flames. Rob, 
Do you think he sees this? Who? The beast. Rob laughed. I told you, he attends to business, but the fire worries him more than it worries Flicker. I wish you didn't have to stay here all night. You might fall asleep. And then he may eat you. Now just figure it out. Figure what out? What that beast is thinking. I don't know what he's thinking. It's only, you know, what the beasts are thinking. What is he thinking? Well, there's Flicker, isn't there? And he knows she's here. Yes, and he knows she's a horse and he loves horse meat. Yes, slim pickings as she is, she's still a horse. But to take a look at her, that crowbar across the top of her, the ropes and the blanket and the posts on each side of her, does she look like any horse that mountain lion has ever seen before? Nell laughed. And here's a fire, continued Rob. It's going to be a roaring big fire. He's never seen that before, and all wild animals are afraid of fire. Only reason Flicker isn't afraid is because she has come to have such complete confidence in us that if we say it's okay, why, all right, it's okay with her too. But the mountain lion, you may be sure, is puzzled and scared this minute. I don't think he'd dare come anywhere near. Nell was silent a moment. Then she rose and picked up the poncho. Where are you going to fix yourself? Right there at the base of the slide, about in the middle between Flicker and the fire, where they'll both be under my eye, and it'll give me a backrest. If the critter should be loco enough to come at us, he'll have to come from the front, the hill's perpendicular right in this place behind me. If he leaped, he'd leap over me. They arranged the poncho and blankets at the foot of the slide, and while Rob busied himself hunting about to find logs and branches to dry out by the fire, Nell stood looking up at the cliff, at the trees, at the wild flight of dark tattered clouds across the heavens. Now and then a brilliant star shone out and was instantly quenched, as suddenly the moon. Look, Rob, there's blood on the moon. Rob paused with his arms full of wood. For a moment the moon could be seen between two clouds, and it was as if a reddish veil was drawn over it. Then a cloud seemed to sweep it out of the sky. Forget it, Nell. Nobody's going to die. You're full of ideas. Nell stood watching for the moon to reappear, but it was a long, dark cloud that had covered it. Well, I've got to go back. Kenny might wake. They argued again as to the division of firearms. Nell felt Rob might need the revolver because he might engage the beast at close quarters. On the other hand, if she should encounter it on the short walk back to the green through the dark pasture, the heavy express rifle would be little help to her. In the end, she took the lantern in her left hand, the loaded revolver in her right, and Rob stood watching her skip across the stones of the brook and go up the path. Soon he could see nothing but the lantern, and watched its progress as it bobbed up the path, paused at the gate, changed its direction as she walked across the green, and finally vanished. Rob got his shot at the line a little before sunrise. He had slept a good deal during the night, with his poncho and blankets making a comfortable backrest for him at the base of the rock slide, both flicker into the fire close enough to tend, the filly to one side of him, and the fire to the other, and the loaded express rifle on the rubber poncho beside him. He felt that he had the situation under his eye. He got up several times during the night, threw wood on the fire, and stood for a few minutes looking around. The night had cleared and the wind died down. The reddish moon rode in the sky. The calf pasture, empty of every living thing except himself and Flicker, seemed very quiet. In the morning, thought Rob, by hook or crook they must get Flicker to the stables, and then I'll go after this mountain lion, dogs, poison or traps, one way or the other I've got to get rid of him. He decided on a trap. That would be the simplest, he thought. He would make a good sized cage of aspen poles, shut half a dozen roosters in it, and ring it around with heavy bear traps properly concealed. 
the cackling of the roosters would attract the lion, and, prowling around the cage, he would be caught in one of the traps. Lions were not so wise nor as wary as coyotes. It was nearly dawn and Rob was sleeping again, with his head fallen forward on his chest, when he was awakened by Flicker's neighing. Even before he had opened his eyes and put his hand on the gun, he knew the neigh for a neigh of terror. He saw that her head was turned and her eyes directed across the creek to the three pines. He looked over and saw the lion feeding at the carcass of the slain heifer. Though it was a huge beast, fully the five feet three, which he had estimated from the measure of its footprints, the thing that struck him was its likeness to poorly in the curving lines of its body, and the way, with feet braced forward, one paw on the skeleton, its muscular body was drawn back, pulling. The heifer's flesh ripped under the long, shining white fangs. The wild cat's tail whipped horizontally back and forth on the earth. Rob put the gun to his shoulder, drew a bead, and fired. He had never shot a mountain lion before. He had heard of the extraordinary vitality of the creature, and how, even mortally wounded, Sometimes carrying several bullets, they still had enough strength to attack and fight ferociously. He now had an opportunity to see this for himself. As the bullet hit the lion, it leaped ten feet in the air, twisting as it curved to the earth. It landed in a ball, turned several somersaults, snarling, regained its feet again. Then, following the treeing instinct, it leaped for the nearest of the three pines. Seizing it, six or eight feet from the ground, the lion hung there a moment, giving the first signs of failing strength. Then he clawed his way rapidly up the trunk and out on the first heavy limb. Rob had felt fairly certain of having shot him through the heart, but now began to wonder if he might have missed or inflicted only a trifling wound. He was lifting the gun to his shoulder for a second shot when he saw that the lion was falling. It slid off the branch and hit the earth fifteen feet below, stone dead. That's the end of chapter 34.